Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with performance and how to improve the human experience. Twice a week, I explore the latest science, technology, and tactics with experts in various fields of human optimization. I'm your host, Boomer Anderson. Enjoy the journey. Superhumans, back with part two of my interview with Dr. Ted Achacoso. Let's recap on Dr. Achacoso. He graduated from college at the age of 18. He received his doctor of medicine degree at the age of 22. His IQ places him in one of the eight smartest people in the world. At 35, he founded and ran a group of collaboration software company and created the first wireless groupware. At 40, he traded currencies using artificial intelligence predictive techniques for a private fund. And at 45, he retrained in interventional endocrinology, aka anti-aging medicine, and in nutritional medicine in Paris, becoming double board certified in both specialties. Dr. Ted is also an author been published in numerous peer-reviewed scientific journals, holds patents, owns software algorithms, provides TV and podcast interviews, and created Health Optimization Medicine, aka HOME, which is a clinical framework that he pioneered to include health management in a disease management practice. Dr. Ted, and today we get into this quite a bit, is also the formulator behind blue canatine, which is the most exciting nootropic to come out in a very long time. Today, we delve into a few interesting topics. One, health optimization medicine. You heard me read about it in the bio and intro, and so we delve a little bit into that. We talk peptides. We get into nootropics and foundationally what needs to be in place before you start looking at elements of cognitive enhancement. And of course, we talk about blue canatine. The show notes for this one are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash home two. Enjoy my lovely conversation with Dr. Ted Achacosa. One of the, the things that I love most about your approach, Dr. Ted, is the use of data in order Mm -hmm. to optimize health. Now you can guess my question, which is how would one differentiate functional medicine from health Mm -hmm. optimization medicine? Functional medicine is actually belongs to the illness medicine class, right? Mm -hmm. To that illness medicine group, they diagnose and treat disease, Mm -hmm. right? And if you take a look at their website, they say that after the root causes of disease. Yeah. In health optimization medicine, we set your disease aside, right? All we look at are your levels of metabolites, of uh, the organisms inside you, uh, of, of your cells, of your mitochondria, and the cofactors that are needed to balance them out. And we balance that. We give you a protocol that balances your hormones and nutrients, right? Mm-hmm. We, and then you get beneficial side effects, right? Your diabetes goes away your, your, or, or is controlled. You, know, uh, you, you don't have as much arrhythmias anymore. Uh, you know, your blood pressure is controlled, your, your um, uh, uh, lipid values come down, right? Your cholesterol goes on and so on and so forth. That, those are beneficial side effects. We don't have any claims, mm-hmm. you know? That's the reason why functional medicine butts heads with illness medicine all the time is because they have claims to treating disease. They diagnose and treat disease. We simply detect and correct imbalances. Mm-hmm. We're, more, we're more looking at the subtle toxicity uh, borderline deficiency syndromes, right? Mm-hmm. And we're more towards checking the network of the holobiont, not the entire body's network, but the holobiont network. How are they communicating? What's being put out there? When you, for example, when you get a microbiome test, you take a look at the different species of organisms. Uh, for example, you see a species there called uh, Acarmasia municifilia, mucinifilia, right? Mm-hmm. And they produce, uh, they actually stimulate the production of mucin. You know, you, you could see that if that's low, then you know that the, the, the intestinal barrier that requires mucin, uh, et cetera, is, is uh, uh, actually overgrowing, right? 
so there would be uh, the, uh, problems with, with absorption and so on and so forth. If there's too much, then you know that it's being eaten away. So you're actually prone to uh, more of a leaky gut. So these are the kinds of things that, um, that you, you do with health optimization medicine is look at the metabolites in relation to the holobiont and looking at the body as an ecosystem of organisms. Not mm -hmm. an ecosystem of organs or anything like that, but an ecosystem of organisms, you know, that are uh, in relationship with each other. Some relationships are symbiotic, some are antagonistic because they're that way, right? They're supposed to be that way. Um, and this is actually, quote unquote, fractalized inside our gut microbiota, you know, um, and we have a lot of species in there. And, you know, the, the Hadza tribe in, in uh, uh, Africa mm -hmm. actually has... Uh, they have Triponema species in their um, in their uh, microbiota. Triponema is a species uh, that uh, produces syphilis, right? But it's just there um, as as part of the species of their microbiota. So you you see then that we're actually um, uh, we have too much um, hubris, right? Mm -hmm. To 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 just take a look at this one perception of the body and it's made of these organs and so on and so forth. Uh, it's true we have come down to the level of the gene, and I know you're interested in genes, but genes can only tell you, you know, the potential, mm -hmm. you know, what, what's, what can happen, right? But the, I chose the metabolome because it can tell you what's happening now so I can address it. So, right? Yep. So, uh, and, and that snapshot, and I, I don't like piecemeal, right? If you're, not, if you're not going to take the entire network of nutrients and you're not going to take a snapshot of an entire network of, of uh, major uh, hormones in the body, then don't come to me. Right? <laughs> so don't go, yeah. get, don't go get your single TSH test or whatever <laughs> it is, right? <laughs> yes. Or don't, don't, yeah, don't get your single test or shot from me. I'll never do it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, look, look, uh, again, in terms of our discussion, in terms of balance, you know, testosterone is an anabolic hormone. So what's the, count, what's the counter hormone that you should give it? You know, it has to be in balance. That's catabolic. You know, you, you should think about these things. Mm -hmm. You know that growth hormone is anabolic. The counter hormone we know is uh, cortisol, right? And this is, this is in, in actual studies. If you raise the cortisol levels of the body, then the growth hormone levels drop. If the growth hormone levels are raised, then the raised and the cortisol le levels drop. So these are there are opposing systems in the body, and there are systems that actually balance each other. The body is uh, is designed that way, you know, because that's how that's what happens when you tinker with the major nodes in the system, right? It will have its ripple effects. This is absolutely incredible, and many people like myself right now, their head is probably exploding. But uh, Dr. Ted. I want to talk a little bit about an email exchange that you and I had, if you don't mind going into this. And mm -hmm. one of these important aspects of health that often gets overlooked or in the personal development world gets phrased as work-life balance is, mm -hmm. uh, I, in my opinion, I was trying to figure out a way to phrase it in terms of, I thought the concept of work-life balance was it's just an interesting way to live considering that we spend eight hours a day or more at work. And you brought up a concept to me in that email that I was like, wow, you've got it. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> I, 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 as I said, uh, you better be warned because I don't recommend and I don't do work, work life balance. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a recipe. That's a recipe for disaster. And, and I uh, agree with you. And that's why, because, <laughs> because it will, it will always get into imbalance. Mm -hmm. Trust me, you know, a, a balance has a fulcrum in it. And <laughs> <laughs> so you, it will take a lot of, it takes a lot of work to balance. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, I, I prefer to do or to recommend to my clients work life integration. And a friend of mine, uh, he was the one who, uh, founded or he started the entire movement on socially responsible investing, right? In 1983, um, he said to me very early on, he said, Ted, my life, my work, what's the difference? Right? So I, I, I pondered upon that statement and I realized that we're actually separating, uh, you know, it, it, we, we're always recommending separate your work life from when you come home and so on and so forth. You know, that's the most difficult thing to do. Right. Mm -hmm. 
you 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 fight with your your spouse or a girlfriend or significant other, and then you come to work, your mood will be affected the whole day, right? So there is no such thing as doing a work life uh, work life balance. You know what I what I would recommend more is integrating your your periods of productivity in work. You know with the the things that you have to do for your personal life. Um, it. Uh, for me, the first thing that I I actually a lot time and this this has to do with your personal scheduling. I'm I'm you know uh, I am I'm, I'm I'm already a master at, at scheduling that flows because of of the type of life uh, lifestyle that I, I need. But in order to integrate uh, uh, my my life and my work, you know, a I make sure that the work that I'm doing is actually what I love or what I like to do, or I am using it as a stepping stone to get somewhere else that I'd like to do. Right? Mm-hmm. So, so that, that's a, that uh, for other people, that's a hard criterion to do. And it's only hard because they're considering the amount of money that they're going to make, you know, uh, in terms of, in terms of that, but the cost of that stress to your health is actually more significant later on. And as I like to say, you know, you, you better spend on your health now, or you better, uh, reduce your stress from your work now by accepting a less stressful job with a slightly less less pay, rather than pay everything in lump sum at the intensive care unit later on in your later years, right? So this this kind of balancing uh, starts to happen early. I, I encourage your your thirty uh, some listeners, you know, to to start looking at how can I balance my uh, my uh, uh, how can, how can I balance my time. Right mm-hmm. in in terms of uh, things that I have to do to take care of myself, you know, things that I have to do to take care of my relationships, and things that I have to do in order to have a comfortable life. So, uh, Antonio Damasio, we are one a uh, neurologist that I follow uh, in my readings. You know, I, I I I follow certain people and what they write. Um, he he said, you know, the, the primary our primary drive is survival without pain. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so when you wake up in the morning, I, a you ask yourself, is your body pain free? B is are your relationships pain free? Mm-hmm. Right. And three, is your work pain free? Then, if it's not, then there's something off with your work life integration. Right. So, um, it, and and you should also be cognizant of cycles. You know, when you integrate. There are times when the rhythm is high, you know, you're very productive at what you do. You're enjoying your family or you're enjoying uh, your personal life. At the same time, you're enjoying your work. And there will be times that will be low because that's just the nature of life. It ebbs and flows, right? Mm-hmm. Um, there will be um, uh, disappointments. Uh, there will be triumphs. Um, and when you take a look at it in that sense, so you know, younger people are harder to teach this than the, the older ones because they can look back on their lives, right? Um, but integ- integrating means for me, having the priority by which you're integrating, right? And for me, I prioritize myself, my life, my health, and my time. Mm -hmm. I always prioritize those. You know, um, a a, a vulgar way of saying is, well, I'm doing this right now, fuck the rest, right? But (laughs) you have to have that, you you have to have a certain core, you know, uh, of what are you... Who are you integrating this for? You're not integrating this for your girlfriend, or you're just not integrating this for your boss. You're integrating this for yourself. Mm-hmm. So you have to determine what's what exactly are your priorities. For me, my priorities are my life, my health, and my time. So when when you know I don't place myself in um, in uncertain positions, risky I can take, right? Risk risk is calculable. Uncertainty is not. Mm-hmm. So people people know that difference. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so, uh, you know, n- no spreadsheet will actually give you any uh, risk calculation for uncertainty. Well, that, that is, <laughs> that's interesting because I've definitely tried that as a person who loves spreadsheets. Now, Dr. Ted, there's so many subjects I want to get into you, into with, uh, with you. And before we go into the next one, uh, the one question I have is when you're looking at your seasons, your rhythms, do you have a particular metric that you've monitored in the past that has allowed you to determine this, or is it just kind of subjective feeling and productivity? Um, 
you know, when when you've when a lot of your listeners, I'm sure, are very self aware. Otherwise, they wouldn't be listening to your podcast, mm-hmm. right? They're the kind of people who they eat a star anise now, and you know, um, and then three hours later, they're not say that they can make the connection. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and that's the kind of um, of metric that they have is always this perpetual uh, self awareness and self observation being able to correlate it immediately to what happened and to patterns that have appeared in your uh, health before, right? So that's, that's, on a, that's a, on a non-laboratory test level, right? But for me, I get my metabolomics, my, my, my metabolome tested, my metabolites tested uh, once every three months. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I can see exactly what my, what my uh, deficiencies are. But uh, that said, you know that that doesn't mean that even if you're not tested, you cannot, you, you, you know, you cannot take a comprehensive vitamin mineral supplement, or you cannot uh, start uh, eating better and so on. But if you are going to take a look at a, at, a, at a metric or a set of metrics, I would uh, basically say you have to take a look at your uh, metrics for your body's molecular inflammation. Okay, right? it's not it's not a gross. In- Inflammation, but the molecular inflammation. Uh, HSCRP, I mentioned. Homocysteine is another one. Mm-hmm. You know, these are simple, simple tests that you could use. You can have a cytokine panel. You know, um, uh, done, uh, done for you to see the balance between your inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Because at the root, you know, we're looking at the reactive oxygen species, right? Mm-hmm. What's your, what's the level of your oxidative stress? Um, you know. Um, you know, how, uh, how, how much is your energy production? Uh, so essentially when you're looking at it uh, with, with the cell as a cellular automaton, again, we back, come back to the concept of the ant, each cell is an ant and, you know, the body is a colony. Um, you know, what is that ant doing? What, how is that, uh, that uh, health of that ant, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and that's the, the most... Um, the most uh, potent metric that you can have, you get an ant bite, you get an inflammation. So there you are. You know, there's, you could remember it very quickly that, that um, the, the, the first thing that the body does uh, when it gets stressed out, right, is it uh, actually rusts your body a little bit faster, right? You, you basically, uh, your, your, since your factory for producing energy produces more uh, waste, like uh, reactive oxygen species that could not be cleared out quickly, then they start clogging up your industrial machinery. And that's how you uh, take a look at it. Any factory has to get cleaned out. You know, it has to be, machines have to be rested. Um, uh, they have to be oiled and so on. It's the same with our cells. Dr. Ted, I want to uh, ask you a few questions about a subject that has intrigued me a lot lately and I don't think it's necessarily new but and I wouldn't necessarily call it a frontier but how do you feel about peptides uh, both as well generally as a class but as a healer but also in using in them in performance you mentioned earlier that you may actually use some of these on yourself for jet lag but how do you feel about peptides broadly maybe something like a bpc157 which is fairly common okay these days. the healing peptide yeah mm-hmm. um uh, here's how i think you know hormones in the body belong to two classes all right either your uh, steroid hormone or your a peptide hormone so your insulin your growth hormone uh your thyroid hormones these are all peptide hormones meaning they're made up of long chains of amino acids right mm-hmm. so um, uh, so essentially what we're, we're doing with uh, peptide technology is simply saying, hey, can we cut this particular hormone? That was the origin, right? Mm-hmm. Can we cut this particular hormone such that it still has the same effect as the original one, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so yay, here, here we cleave, here we do you know, on one end, we add a little something so that instead of just being in the bloodstream or in the body for two minutes, or 20 minutes, it can go on for at least an hour or, an, uh, you know, or the entire day. Like uh, IGF-1, uh, LR3, for example, would, would go on for 72 hours, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the IGF-1 is actually produced by the body. So we're, we're, there are different uh, types of uh, IGF, you know, 1, 2, and 3. And, and the IGF-1 uh, LR, for example, is one that we have 
uh, added some moieties uh, at the end in order to make it stay longer in the body. So as a class, you know, as a medical class, like for example, sermarlin, which is a growth hormone releasing uh, hormone. I was right? just going to ask you about this one because yeah. tesamorlin is very yeah. interesting. It's like sermarlin, tesamorlin, these are, these are approved, right? Tesamorlin is approved mm -hmm. as a drug for growth hormone releasing hormone. So what we're looking at now is First, we tinker with uh, natural peptides and shorten them and see if they still have actions. And then we experiment with analogs. Can these peptides bind with the same receptors as this effect that we're wanting mm -hmm. to do? Right? And so those are the uh, class of, of peptides now. But if you see even BPC-157, it has been transiently detected in the gut already. Mm -hmm. right? So you can see that it's actually nothing new. So what we want to do is to actually make them act a little bit longer. See, I use BPC-157, for example, for post-surgical patients. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, and, and, uh, and it, it allows them to heal so much more quickly. So you, it's now that we know these pieces of information, and I said, I'm very clinical. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can discuss all you want about the structure and the function and so on and so forth. But if you're seeing the rapid improvements in, in your patients, then, you know, you, you, you see that all of these things have merit when they're actually jacked up a little in terms of their amount in the body and uh, uh, for a specific number of days. Right? Any concern on uh, the peptides with growth hormone and it affecting per natural production of growth hormone? Um, actually, what I like about the growth hormone releasing hormones and their analogs, right, the analog peptides, mm -hmm. is that they are growth hormone releasing hormones. So they would induce your uh, pituitary to produce the actual growth hormone, right? In fact, that's why I like them for longer term use. So uh, I would put my um, uh, clients and patients only for about a year or two in very, very low dose growth hormone. Um, and then actually I would shift them to uh, growth hormone releasing hormone or their analogs. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I do is, you know, a year three, I put you on, um, on a rotation basis. You know, you only take growth hormone for two months, you take some other thing for a month, you know, uh, because by the time there's also such a thing called injection fatigue, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the people get, um, so you give them injection breaks for, uh, one or two months, and you alternate essentially the actual hormone with the peptides that can actually uh, release the hormone itself. So for me, the negative feedback uh, occurs only if your doses are super physiologic, meaning they're very high. Uh, they are at therapeutic levels, meaning you're trying to treat the disease. Mm -hmm. right? But when you're only trying to balance, and you could see this in the values, right? If you're only trying to balance something, then it doesn't do a shut off. The reason why it shuts off in bodybuilders uh, is that you're using very high doses. I mean, you know, um, a bodybuilder would be using like, like four IU of growth hormone, and I would be using like 0.4. Mm -hmm. So, or 0.2 is the lowest dose that I give, right? So, um, and I would never go beyond one. So, uh, and only for a short period of time, and always in a network, right? Yeah. Always in a network. Uh, so. So for me, if you do that, then your brain, your, your, your uh, HPA axis actually doesn't shut down. So that's, this is incredible. And so Dr. Ted, I want to transition into another topic, which is a fascination of mine, a uh, fascination of many people listening to this show, which is cognitive enhancement. And I want to talk specifically about nootropics and what under what conditions do you think people should start taking nootropics? I've heard you talk about the foundations that need to be built, some of the things that we've talked about earlier, but what are the foundations that are needed in order to make nootropics more effective and work as people would like them to? Yeah. Um, first, you know what I uh, I'd like to repeat what I said before. You cannot optimize the brain without optimizing brain health first. Mm -hmm. So you have to optimize of your, the health of your brain cells. You can now take a look at you know, your neurotransmitter production. Uh, it used to be that we had to drill the brain and get a brain sample in order to do that, right? But now you can do that in urine, 
uh, and they can correlate it to your platelet levels, and and uh, that correlates to the brain levels. Um, uh, you have to make sure that your amino acids, your neurotransmitters are made up of amino acids. So you have to make sure that the raw material is actually there. And you could measure your amino acid levels in the blood, right? You could measure uh, y- your, your, your levels of, uh, for example, uh, tyrosine for the production of dopamine. Um, you could measure the tryptophan for the production of serotonin and so on. So it, it, it's no longer um, uh, a difficulty. If for us to uh, optimize the brain cell, you know, optimizing, you know, the way you think is a totally different thing. You have to talk to a psychologist or to a psychiatrist to do that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we can optimize your brain cells. You know, newer findings, uh, like for example, the optimal, the, the the preferred fuel of the brain at rest is lactate, and it's not glucose. So. These are the kinds of things that we we uh, are, are slowly finding out, right? So the dogmas before that this is a major fuel of the brain, um, you know, glucose is, and, and so on and so forth. These are slowly getting changed, but it, we're slow to change, right? Um, so you, you you optimize that, and then so so you optimize the normal function by making sure you you have. Uh, uh, the optimal levels of neurotransmitters. You're not lacking in amino acids for the production. You're not lacking in, in any of the vitamins, minerals, or cofactors that uh, actually will um, uh, impede in the uh, brain functioning. I essentially um, just, uh, if, if I look at the brain, I basically look at certain basic neurotransmitters, right? Dopamine for focus, mm-hmm. right? And then uh, serotonin for relaxedness, right? Or they call that your happy hormone, but it's actually it it it, it it's more it's more a parasympathetic inducer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then and then there is um, norepinephrine uh, epinephrine for wakefulness, mm-hmm. right? So uh, for wakefulness, and you, I take a look at acetylcholine for your memory. So if you just are able to take a look at those and make sure that the components for those are. Uh, you know, the raw materials for their production and uh, the cofactors that are necessary for their uh, production are there and at uh, optimal levels and the uh, uh, metabolites that are being produced in the brain at optimal levels, then you can consider your brain optimized and then you take your nootropics, right? Nootropics is like overclocking your computer. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether or not people still know that. <laughs> but I used to do that. <laughs> I, I I used to overclock my CPU all the time, uh, so I I don't know who still does that. But um, uh, but anyway, um, then on top of that, you're going to rev up your brain function. So, doc, Dr. Ted, just real quick before it, you mentioned just clocking out your CPU, and I should have asked this question as soon yeah. as you said it. But if I were to take nootropics and let's say be in a state where I'm sleeping less than six hours and I eating junk food. Et cetera, et cetera. Is there a danger in just kind of short circuiting the system, so to speak? There are sh- very um, pronounced short term effects because basically you're pushing a system that's already stressed out to be more stressed, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you take a nootropic that, for example, produces a lot of dopamine, the next day you will have no focus, mm-hmm. right? Because, and, and you will feel, you know, uh, or if you, you overclock your serotonin, the next day you feel like shit. Um, that's what happens to you when you take ecstasy, yeah. right? So, um, so th- these these are the kinds of things that um, you should be wary about. And the longer term effects is that they're now finding that even single doses of very very high doses of these things that you think are good for you in the short term. Um, actually, the neurons recover a lot slower than we think, despite all the claims to neuro- neuroplasticity, et cetera, et cetera. There are long-term effects on the circuits that, is, that the uh, brain actually has to maintain for your focus, mm-hmm. for example. One of, uh, one of the ways that I got introduced to nootropics, and many people did, was through modafinil. Um, uh-huh. I use it now f- predominantly for jet lag. How do you, it, mm-hmm. it, modafinil in general, there's been some rumors about, you know, side effects, et cetera. There are noted side effects. How do you feel about mm-hmm. modafinil use for people? Um, I, uh, generally, I, uh, if you're hypertensive, I don't prescribe modaf- modafinil because it raises your blood pressure. Mm-hmm. Uh, personally, I take modafinil only one fourth tab because 
you know, I don't like the rise in my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, and people before taking it, they should test one fourth tab to see whether or not they develop their reactions to it. I'm highly, I'm highly reactive to the side effects of modafinil, mm -hmm. right? But I love the drug, right? However, if I take a drafinil, which is, you know, which just has one molecule that's cleaved by the liver to produce modafinil, the side effects are less pronounced. So, uh, so for me, it's, it's the way your body is going to handle the modafinil, right? I don't have any qualms, you know, uh, on using it, but using it prudently. Mm -hmm. Again, there's the term prudence, right? You have to, just because someone is taking in a full dose doesn't mean that you have to take it. Yeah. The, you know? the, the self titration need. Yes. Uh, titration is always good. Uh, when it comes to these things, there are, there are parts, you know, in illness medicine, you know, you have to give the antibiotic at, you know, a loading dose. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's likelihood of failure is higher. But when it comes to health, you're basically optimizing things. You start low and, and you actually titrate it upwards, right? Unless you actually want to shut an organ down to give it a rest, <laughs> right? Uh, that can go into so many different avenues. <laughs> so one thing I, I want to ask about before we go into prescriptions is microdosing. I live here in Amsterdam and to be fair, I haven't really, I haven't partaked in, partaken in microdosing. And oh, <laughs> you're you're not responsive to your environment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so there's some things that I, I still have yet to try, and I, I'm trying to design what I believe to be the best experiment for this because the idea of microdosing and performance is something that's been touted by Silicon Valley, etc. Uh, but mm. if you were to design a, an experiment around microdosing, it could be LSD, it could be psilocybin. Um, what would be the metric that you'd want to measure uh, aside from I'm, go ahead. yeah i'm i'm very physical when it comes to the things uh you know uh, i allow other people to design the, the subjective questions and the feeling of you, you of the feeling good and so on and so forth those are soft measures right mm -hmm. i'm after the hard measures like how much is my dopamine production how much is my serotonin production how much is my um uh, you know, from, from my baseline, you know, does microdosing do all these? Because you know that a full dose will actually raise those several hundred fold. Mm -hmm. But even just, you know, even just will it cost like uh, 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 even just a, a micro fluctuation or a small fluctuation that during that day, you know, during that day, I'm actually having um, higher fluctuations of these levels of neurotransmitters. Um, so I would, I, I would identify them, you know, for example, for, um, if you microdose LSD, then you have to monitor, um, serotonin levels, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's where, so, so th that's what I, that's what I do. The tests are available now. So to be able to do that. So those are the hard, for me, the hard measures that you can do, Excellent. right? The other hard measures that you could do is, uh, of course, uh, as assessment of, uh, skill, mm -hmm. like for example, computer programmers, uh, you know, you give them a particular problem to solve and you determine the time by which they're able to, to um, uh, solve the problem with the fewest lines of code possible, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, how elegant their, their computing is or how elegant their computing becomes when they're under a, a, a microdose uh, of uh, LST, which is very common in Silicon Valley, right? So, so those, are, those, are, those are now... Um, Objective measures in terms of behavior. I, 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 you know, for me, my objective measures are in the physical apparatus itself. What is it producing, mm -hmm. or what is it producing um, that is not normally produced? You know, in, in in even no matter how low the levels are, as long as there is uh, some fluctuation, then you know you know that it's doing something, right? And then with measures of work, you know, uh, objective measures of, of output, just as those for computer programmers, you know, you can derive a lot of uh, 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 data from that. And then, of course, for subjective measures, uh, like uh, uh, the woman who wrote this book, you know, she's been on several podcasts where she says she's uh, normally depressive, but for once that day, the first time she took it, um, microdose LSD, like everything, it's like, there was no negative emotional content attached to the things that he was seeing. In other words, she had no anhedonia, right? She had, she, there was pleasure in looking at things or listening to music. Mm -hmm. So that's, 
So, and that's that's very subjective, right? Um, I know that many people who are burnt out or close to burning out have lost the joy of of, of uh, this, the details of life, right? Mm-hmm. Like the deliciousness of a red apple or the coolness of a, a falling rain. You know, it's it's always all of these stories that are going in my head. I have to produce this. You know, my wife won't let me. Blah 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 blah. And and how quiet is your brain during that day? Right. Um, so, so these are the kinds of things that you could do on in terms of uh, soft measures, um, hard measures in in terms of um, of memory can also be done, like word recall and so on and so forth. But, for example, uh, microdosing is more is a lot better for creative uh, uses, right? You have to to add another uh, substance to actually give you the focus. Right, and people always mistake this, and I'm I'm going to tell you, listeners, just because you have, for example, the best nootropic for for focus, doesn't mean you're going to be focused on the right thing. Okay, <laughs> so, so, there still needs so, to be a, a an element of priority. It's not necessarily like NZT, right? <laughs> you you have to be motivated, mm-hmm. and there is no drug for motivation, <laughs> right? The drug for motivation is experiencing initial success, mm-hmm. right? So if you got success at something, it motivates you to succeed again. You may fail, but it's a motivation to succeed again. So it, people always confuse that. You know, just because you're, you're, you're focused doesn't mean you're focusing on something that's actually important to you. you know? <laughs> there, there, there was a time when I, um, I tried to take, um, uh, what's this, uh, methylphenidate, mm-hmm. right? To see to see its effects on me, it's like, yeah, it's nice, but um, you know, the whole day I was just watching YouTube videos and I, I wasn't focusing <laughs> on anything else. And I said, <laughs> you know, not not exactly the desired effect that you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like I'm so focused, but I wanted to watch videos. That's all that I wanted to do. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's it's now a prescription for laziness, right? <laughs> yeah that's great uh so uh, this is thank you because i was looking for some clarity around how to structure this and you know I, i'm of course taking full responsibility none of this is medical advice guys if you're listening to this you know please go see your doctor uh but i was looking at sort of who you your doctor who likely would not know anything <laughs> about it <laughs> <laughs> this is this is uh, and, unless he's gone to a few raves himself <laughs> exactly so, <laughs> so uh, I, I was looking at sort of what the before and after measurements should be and this gives me a lot of clarity around that can we talk about transcriptions because uh before we, before i give you the mic to go through this in detail i have to say uh our mutual friend tim who seems to be known mm-hmm. as the supplier of mm-hmm. these lovely uh, these lovely, you know, we can call them trochees. I guess they are trochees, right? Trochees, yeah. yes. So yes, they these are. lovely trochees gave me one recently, and uh, we were at a a conference in Munich, and I went what Scott described as full Smurf mode, and had yes. this amazing experience. And it's mm-hmm. it's a nootropic that I have one of the most exciting things that I've seen come out in a long time. And I would love for you to just explain in detail for me, for the audience, uh, everything that you can about blue canatine. Yeah, uh, blue canatine actually is derived from its name, right? The, the ingredients. It's methylene blue, um, ca for caffeine, na for cannabidiol, and teen for nicotine, right? And um, I formulated this four years ago as a gum. Um, you know, after I saw the studies on methylene blue um, and caffeine and cannabidiol and nicotine, and um, uh, it, it it was good. I mean, I, I made the gum myself in my kitchen using sapodilla resin and all of that kind of stuff. Yes, I do that. Kind of <laughs> stuff, you know, <laughs> your, your kitchen has some uh, interesting stuff in it. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Um, uh, it, yeah, I, I, I have a CRISPR Cas9 gene editing lab in my bathroom. Seriously, <laughs> but, but but anyway, um, um, so because what I saw uh, when I was, I, I don't know how how I came to be the mitochondria expert. 
<laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But but uh, since I love, uh, I, I was I was a re- one of the original mitochondriacs that uh, was actually being interviewed on podcasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I saw this uh, study on methylene blue and um, and memory, mm-hmm. right? And then so I started examining because methylene blue is a drug, right, for use for methemoglobinemia, methemoglobinemia, right, and it's an electron donor. And you know that at very low doses, uh, you know, um, um, a, of, of uh, methylene blue, it actually serves an electron donor to facilitate the electron transport chain. Now, high levels of it would have the, uh, uh, a different effect, right? It would provide oxidative stress. So, but in the study where they use 100 milligrams just for a short term, you know, uh, word recall and all of those things that you do with memory, they found out that it has significant effect on memory. And this was a human test. And that's why I said, well, okay, you know, if I had to be limitless for about three or four hours, I need something like this, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, for, uh, for caffeine, caffeine has been used forever and ever, you know, uh, everyone knows the effects of caffeine. Um, uh, and then, um, however, caffeine can give you jitters, right? So um, I had to round it out with some uh, CBD or cannabidiol aside from, from the effect on CB1 receptors in the brain, uh, you know, mellowing, it, mellowing, mellowing down the, the circuit uh, a little bit, you know, it actually also removes the sharpness or the jaggedness of both uh, actually caffeine and nicotine. And then um, nicotine, you know, is uh, hailed as the cheapest, most effective nootropic, right? Uh, people are just afraid uh, because of uh, the ad- ad- uh, addiction from nicotine, etc. Actually, the high addiction rates are from smoking. It's not really from nicotine, mm-hmm. right? Um, uh, the 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 issue with nicotine is that at very high doses, you uh, it actually uh, increases uh, uh, capillary growth, and it, that's bad for tumorigenesis or for the production of tumors, right? However, at very low doses, that were, like what we're using, it is actually quite a nootropic. If you take a look at um, blue canatine, for example, uh, there are uh, uh, four turkeys per pack. Oh, by the way, um, we started uh, actually uh, selling it already to those who actually um, signed up in our list. Oh, um, I haven't got the email yes. yet, but I was on the list. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's because I'm yeah, in, started, maybe it's because I'm in Europe. I don't know. It's a, well, we're, I'm, I'll make sure we'll send. You. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, and then, um, um, so in terms of. Um, of uh, the uh, sort of like the effects of nicotine, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it's not, you know, we, 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 we know very well how it can focus you, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's uh, the um, uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, right? That it's, it's uh, uh, working on. Um, so w- we know that in uh, humans, the... Um, the doses of nicotine are required are really very high and they have to be in, in um, uh, a cigarette form. And even now in the vapes, it's not the nicotine that's actually causing the problem, but the oils that they use in the vapes, mm-hmm. right? So, um, and what I did was there's only four um, trochees per box uh, because I don't want to, you to exceed um, four trochees a day. You can, but I don't recommend it. And it's actually... Uh, since it's a trochee, uh, there's a clear scoring. You could even titrate it by starting with one fourth if you wanted to, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and um, uh, you see the effects. And then if uh, what you do is you put it between your upper cheek and your gum, right, and in the buccal cavity over there. You don't want the saliva to actually uh, wash it away because you want a direct absorption, mm-hmm. right, uh, right there. Um, so. And what uh, you, you you can better describe the effects on you, but what I was after is, you know, how can I how can I boost brain function, you know, make you limitless for about two to three uh, three to four hours without actually overclocking anything, right? Mm-hmm. Without overclocking anything, and without any uh, harsh come down like you get from. It, you know, um, many, many um, uh, uh, nootropics. And as a, it's actually effective, right? How it, because for me, a nootropic must first be, before 
before it is effective, it must first be protective. Mm-hmm. And that's how I define my nootropics, right? So if I'm going to do something like this and I'm going to rev up the brain, you know, first I, I got to make sure that the brain is protected enough in order to, to use this, um, these uh, particular substances. That's why they, they are in relatively low doses, but they are effective enough to get the function that we want, mm-hmm. right? The, the additional function that we want. So um, when, when th- this was a gum and no confectioner wanted to touch it because it turned all of their equipment blue. So I had to formulate it as a trochee. Um, and uh, now we're actually in production uh, of, the tro- uh, of the blue canadine trochee. And uh, actually the... Um, the uh, the effect did not take me by surprise, but the people loving it the first time they take it is it was actually such a joy to me. It's like this is something that I fucking formulated just for myself. <laughs> Look, you know, just, <laughs> uh, it's just it's just like um it's just like um Zinser in his on writing well a book called on writing well right. Mm-hmm. He says first write for an audience of one. So for me, first make a nootropic for myself. And then, and then I can share it. And it's it's fun. It, it you're right. And I think the way like the methylene blue interacts with the mouth. Of course, that's a great marketing uh, add on. Mm-hmm. But also, it's fun. It helped me at these conferences. You end up in a lot of you know intellectually challenging conversations, and you know anything from recall to the clarity of thought was there. And so, thank you. It's an incredible experience. Yeah. You're welcome. You know what? Uh, when I presented this to marketing experts uh, three years ago, they said this will never fly because it turns your tongue blue. That's exactly why it should fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I said, well, thank you very much. Here's your money for your consulting. I am going ahead with it anyway. And, you know, they, they uh, actually just emailed me and said, we see that, uh, you know, your, your uh, blue canatine is blowing up in the internet. And then I said, well, you know, <laughs> the, you, you, market, is, market is fickle. You can only model it so much. Yeah, exactly. Right? There's always a black swan in the, in the craft. And there's always, there's, o- there's always a, a fat tail. That's true. Right? So. <laughs> Absolutely. This is amazing. Where can people find out more about blue canatine, Dr. Ted? Um, they can go to uh, transcriptions.com. That's T-R-O-S, as in prescriptions, but T-R-O for trochee. Uh, transcriptions.com and then there is the Instagram is also at transcriptions. Um, they can find me at healthoptimizationmedicine.org. That's with a Z um, because we're not in Europe. Uh, <laughs> or uh, or ho- homehope.org, uh, which is easier to remember for health optimization medicine. We actually have there uh, already all the uh, we have there the, the courses that are available and will be available soon uh, for you to train in health optimization medicine because there's only one of me that can train. By the way, you don't have to be a doctor to train. Mm -hmm. Health optimization medicine is for um, doctors. Health optimization practice or hope is for uh, healthcare practitioners. Perfect. Uh, And the the requirements are there. And you either want to just want to complete the course and there's also an additional exam if you want to practice. Right? Because you have to be within, again, within the network of those who actually practice it. Uh, and then the other one here in the Philippines is uh, biobalanceinstitute.com. Uh, and uh, our Instagram is at biobalanceph. Excellent. I'm, so that's where I am. I'm going to link to all of this stuff in the show notes. But before I let you go, Dr. Ted, I have to ask you a final six rapid fire questions. We call these the superhuman six. Uh, these are just right. designed as rapid fire. So. Uh, let's start with the first one, which I'm going to substitute in. Ju- I'm going to substitute in just for for you, which is how do you keep track mm-hmm. of all of your research that you're doing? Um, when you love the things that you do, when when you're curious about certain things, you will automatically keep track of things. If something doesn't interest you, it's just like something that you kept inside a drawer. So. The way you track the things that interest you is leaving your mess outside where you can continue to work in them, right? So, for example, 
if you're saying, hey, I can't, uh, you know, I used to read uh, four books a month. Now I, I only read a book a month. You know, why don't you open four different books in, in, in your house or in your office and in your spare time, just read a chapter or a few paragraphs and then you could finish the same thing. So w- the way you keep track is keep it visible, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it, it, it pays to be neat, but not that neat. Other, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. This is great. And it sound, it echoes in a way a little bit like Ernest Hemingway, who would kind of finish mid-sentence or, or put the pen down mid-sentence and then come back to it after, well, Hemingway would have numerous yes. mojitos um, <laughs> and then come back the next day. Or, or, or coming, coming off the boxing room. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, what's the favorite piece of, or your favorite piece of technology that you've purchased in the last year? Actually, I have not. Um, purchase any technology in the past year the only piece of technology that i bought is actually retro it's a note paper notebook yes so i <laughs> it's a paper notebook with a pencil and uh, that's what i've come back to right because uh, and here's why i just want to tell you quickly because all of these uh, gadgets that we have they tend to promote attention deficit disorder mm-hmm. right for example tw- twitter you know um it limits you to the number of characters in there, and there's your attention deficit. You know, your, your to-do list, you're, you're forced to, to cram it into a list with time, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have any time to think about it. There's beauty in thinking and writing in longhand. Mm-hmm. I like to doodle uh, geometric figures. And while I do three, three-dimensional geometric figures, you know, I get answers to what I'm thinking about. So that's my... Um, my uh, piece of technology that I finally bought this year. Excellent. And some of those geometric figures I feel like can go on for another show if we want. <laughs> At some point I want to, maybe when we meet up in London, I want to ask you about tensegrity structures, but that I think that's okay. a full, full another conversation. <laughs> How do you unwind? Well, um, as I said, you know, I, I, um, uh, I unwind uh, by going to the bathroom, I have a CRISPR <laughs> Cas9 gene, <laughs> CRISPR Cas9 gene editing lab there, and I try to edit genes because it's fun. You, you know, um, I, I think we're, you're, if you can afford to do this, it's not that expensive. Um, is how could you deprive yourself of technologies that are affecting the world? Right, CRISPR Cas9 is one of them. I was the same with, uh, for example, when when uh, uh, polymerase chain reaction, the PCR technology first came out, I actually um, uh, volunteered to a friend of mine uh, to drive him around. He was a professional bi- violinist and molecular biologist to drive him around to all of his concerts if he would sneak me in at NIH at midnight so I could learn about polymerase chain reaction. So these are these are. Uh, uh, life-changing technologies for humankind, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And and so for me, it's a deprivation if in this lifetime I don't get to try them. You know, I have the uh, I have the interest to try them, and so it's like, why do, why can't I make a non glowing bacteria glow by inserting a phosphorescent gene, for example? So you know, for me, that's my that's my way of unwinding. Right? I'm having fun uh, oh. by myself without <laughs> any other people. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll come join you. That that actually sounds like a blast. Uh, what's what's the best thing you do to enhance your productivity, if anything? Okay, all, all of your male listeners will hate me on this mm-hmm. one. Okay, is avoid sex. Okay, when when you are in a heavy project, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, need all of your energy. You avoid sex. That the, your energy for your production is going to be uh, uh, diverted uh, towards your project, uh, at the, that where you need to be productive. Or two, if you have sex, don't ejaculate. So even boxers know this. Right? Yeah, it's like a pugil- classic Rocky pugil- one, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, just try it and see. You know. Um, uh, because if you're focused enough, you'll actually forget about it. Mm-hmm. You know? So um, uh, others say, well, you know, I need to ejaculate because I I feel rested and, and so on. Um, after it, well, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for me, but it does work for uh, people that I've given the advice to. You know? Mm-hmm. Uh, some have even adopted longer periods of time. 
uh, for the 40 days and 40 nights oh, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, if you have a, if you have a project, you can save up your energy to, for that because uh, reproduction or the energy for reproduction, even if you're not actually reproducing, uh, actually requires energy, right? Mm-hmm. And your body requires energy to produce your, um, your gametes and, and so on. So you have to, you know, um, if you if you want to use that for something else, then you're you actually have extra energy to do so. What's your favorite holiday destination? Oh, there is a book uh, that title that says it all. It says "Inner Journeys to Outer Space." So um, I, I actually uh, prefer using um, certain molecules to go inward mm-hmm. and do my vacation up there. So, but if you're going to ask me for a specific place, um, uh, it's sorry, it's not Amsterdam. Although I love the city. <laughs> when you're here, I'll show you around. <laughs> I, I was I was just there, um, you know, um, I think uh, early part of this year. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, anyway, um, um, what in this place? When I stepped off the train, I actually exclaimed. I said. I can die here. In other words, the place was so beautiful, it took my breath away. Wow. And that was Sitges in Spain, right? Mm-hmm. Wow, a- I, I, I'm adding this to the top of my list. That's a, that's a resound, you know, TripAdvisor can't get a review like that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. The, the, I stepped off the train from Barcelona, and when I saw it, I said, it literally took my breath away. It was so beautiful. And what I exclaimed was, I can die here. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you know, uh, I have a friend um, uh, who lost. He's a physicist, and he lost a bet with me on on uh, the nature of humans being nomadic. So he's he he and his wife sold their home in Virginia and started moteling for for or, or for about three years to find that ideal place. And then they they finally asked me, Ted, what's your criterion for you to stay in a place?" Right, and I said, "It should." take my breath away i could i should be able to say i can die here yeah it's a great that's a great criteria actually there's very few places on the earth that i would say that so far but uh on these inner journeys to outer space i would love to unpack that a little bit more some other time Mm -hmm. but i want to be cognizant of your time what book Mm -hmm. has significantly impacted your life and how you show up to perform in it it's actually um, a very old book. Uh, if you're resourceful enough, you could actually get a PDF copy of it on the internet. Um, it's Illusions by uh, Richard Bach. It's his second book after Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Um, and there is the, you know, it's called Illusions, the Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's actually um, your, you know, your your podcast is the coding humor, superhuman, right? And that's actually a superhuman, you know, what a superhuman would look like if he came here. And it actually borrows heavily on uh, the uh, Buddhist and and uh, and uh, Hindu philosophies, Eastern philosophies, but they are in in um, yeah, beautifully written, you know, as a. Uh, Someone who's uh, flying a bi- biplane, someone who's teaching him about clouds and all of these uh, kinds of things. But it's a, it, it has a Messiah's Handbook in it, right? Mm-hmm. And the reason I, I love it is that at the end, it says, everything in this book may be wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> this is just a reminder to all of your listeners that everything that I said right now may have been wrong. So <laughs> I love the humility and this is a this is a great spot to end the show Dr. Ted Achikoso this has been a mind-blowing experience for me I'm going to cancel the rest of my day and do a lot of integration this is incredible thank you so much Oh you're welcome and thank you for having me uh and introducing me to your um um uh listeners you know this uh, is... I hope they get I hope they gain something this. I, I just given the amount of notes I've taken, I'm sure everybody will gain a lot from this. And we'll of course link to everything from blue canatine to how you can find out more about Dr. Ted's work in health optimization medicine in the show notes. But Dr. Ted, thanks again. This is amazing. You're welcome. And to your listeners, 
if you're chairing a meeting tomorrow, please just don't ejaculate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Thank you, sir. Okay. Bye-bye. Superhumans. I didn't want to stop talking to Dr. Ted, but out of respect to his time, I had to let him go. This was an incredible conversation for me, and I would love to continue it with Dr. Ted in the future. If you enjoyed the episode, please share it with your friends, but also head over to iTunes, lead us a five-star rating, and just say, hey, I want Dr. Ted back on the show. We'll bring him back on, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in a couple of days, actually, at the Health Optimization Summit. Enjoy this episode. Enjoy your day. Enjoy life and elevate your human experience. Have an epic day, superhumans.